Barry Weiss, a few days ago, uh, over the last few days, has published two, I think, important letters that go to the heart of this. The first is by a teacher. And the title of the, the title of this is, I refuse to stand by while my students are indoctrinated. Children are afraid to challenge the repressive ideology that rules our schools. That's why I am. Now you'll notice, sadly, that even though these individuals speak up, identify clear evils in the approach of those trying to indoctrinate our children, they don't really have an answer. They don't provide an alternative, an alternative lens, an alternative view of the world, an alternative way to integrate what we see around us. And that's why I fear, I fear that in spite of the fact that there's now opposition, I don't know how long it can last because it provides an alternative. And of course, that only opens it up for, if we go back to the dim hypothesis, for the alternative to be some misintegration on a large scale, an M2 that will lead us directly into authoritarianism, just so we can avoid the complete fragmentation of our society caused by this nonsense being taught in our schools. So this is a letter from a teacher at Grace Church High School in Manhattan. Grace Church, it's a religious school, dominated, but, but very, very leftist. He writes, my school is asking me to embrace anti-racism, anti-racism training and pedagogy that I believe is deeply harmful to them, to the students, and to any person who seeks to nurture the virtues of curiosity, empathy, and understanding. What does this anti-racism training require? It requires teachers like myself, he writes, to treat students differently on the basis of race. It requires them to be racists, because that's what racism means, treating people differently based on their race. Furthermore, in order to maintain a united front for our students, teachers at Grace are directed to confine our doubts about this pedagogical framework to conversations with an in-house, listen to this, Office of Community Engagement. As you read this, if you know a little bit of history, think about how different or the same this is with Mao's Cultural Revolution. The teacher writes, my school, like many others, induces students by shame and sophistry to identify primarily with their race before their individual identities are fully formed. Students are pressured to conform their opinions to those broadly associated with their race and gender and to minimize or dismiss individual experiences that don't match those assumptions. The morally compromised status of oppressor is assigned to one group of students based on the immutable, color of their skin, characteristics. In the meantime, dependency, resentment, and moral superiority are cultivated in students considered oppressed from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. The oppressor, the oppressed. All this, of course, is done in the name of equity, the new catchphrase for the left. So this teacher recently raised questions about this ideology in a mandatory whites-only students and faculty Zoom. Can you imagine having a whites-only meeting Whites only bathrooms, whites only beaches. Disgusting. It's just so mindlessly primitive and barbaric. It doesn't, it doesn't, I mean, what, what strikes me, it makes me so angry is it doesn't really justify comment. Why do we need to be commenting on this? Why do we need to be discussing this? Racism. Since the 1960s, has been identified as evil. And these people are embracing it wholeheartedly with a moral superiority that is just disgusting. 
Now, it turned out that this meeting by Zoom for white only was a bait and switch self-care seminar labeled, that labeled objectivity, individualism, fear of open conflict, and even a right to comfort as characteristics of white supremacy. Individualism is characteristic of white supremacy. And, you know, we can go on and on. Anyway, the teacher, after he confronted this and challenged some of these assumptions, was informed by the head of high school that his philosoph philosophical challenges has caused harm to students, harm. Given that these topics were life and death matters about people's flesh and blood and bone, he was reprimanded for acting like an independent agent, God forbid, of a set of principles or ideas of belief. He was told that by doing so, he failed to serve, quote, the greater good and the higher truth. He created dissonance for vulnerable and uninformed thinkers and neurological disturbance in students. I mean, it was borderline what he did constituted harassment. Why? Because he challenged the authorities. He challenged the perspective of the new little intellectual dictators. A public reprimand, this is so Chinese cultural revolution, a, ch a, a, a public reprimand was then read aloud in all the classes about this teacher's conduct. He then had to, you know, uh, uh, anyway, by writing this article, by pointing all this out, right? Pointing all this out, he committed a sin. He challenged the authorities. He's been told to work at home now, can't come into the school, because he poses a threat to his students. Or, or people oppose the threats against him. So he is a security threat. They won't fire him, they say. But they've asked him to teach from home using Zoom. <sighs> Last year at Grace, this religious school, the students asked for some diversity of points of view. And uh, the teacher thought of bringing in Glenn Lowry, a Brown University professor and public intellectual, you might know him, he's very good, who is black, but who is, I'd say, center-right or kind of a nuanced thinker. He thinks, wow, what a concept. The head of school banned it. Quote, this is the quote, the head of my school. People like Lowry's lived experience and therefore, he has derived social philosophy. Notice that the only way he can have an idea is because he lived it. He can't actually develop an idea. Made him an exception to the rule that black thinkers acknowledge structural racism as the paramount impediment in society. In other words, Lowry didn't come to the conclusion that structural racism doesn't exist. His shared experiences, his lived experience, shaped him to have that view. No free will, no self-determination. The headmaster, the head of school, added, "The moment we are in institutionally and uh, the moment we are in institutionally and culturally, does not lend itself to dispassionate discussion and debate. And having Lowry's ideas would only confuse or inflame students, both those in the class and others that hear about it outside class. He preferred to assign." Mainstream white conservative than having a black conservative, because that's too confusing. Black and conservative, it's like black and object. I mean, you can't do that. An objectivist, you can't, you, that's not allowed. Notice how they want everything to be about race. They want everything to be about skin color. They want you to feel guilty for being white. They want you deep, and they want you to go deep in feeling a victim because you're not white. I mean, 
these kids are being trained, tra trained to be racist under the guise of a fantastic, superior private education. Finally, yesterday, I think it was, a parent spoke up. And this is an excellent, excellent, excellent essay that I encourage you all to read. Barry Weiss published it. It is called um, A New York Father Pulls His Daughter Out of Brearly with a Message to the Whole School. Um, it is, uh, Barry Weiss published it, so it's on her Substack, barryweiss.substack.com. It's excellent. If, if parents did this, this problem would be gone. I'm going to read you, I'm going to read some of this letter to you. And he's writing this to the parents. This is a parent of a student. Dear fellow Brilli parents, our family recently made the decision to not, decision not to re-enroll our daughter at Brilli for the 2021-22 school year. She has been at Brilli for seven years, beginning in kindergarten. In short, we no longer believe that Brilli administration and board of trustees have any of our children's best interests at heart. Moreover, we no longer have confidence that our daughter will receive the quality of education necessary to further her development into critically thinking, responsible, enlightened, and civic-minded adult. I write to you as a fellow parent to share our reasons for leaving the Brearley community. It cannot be stated strongly enough that Brearley's obsession with race must stop. Brearley is a 40,000, sorry, $54,000 a year all-girls school. $54,000. It should be abundantly clear to any thinking parent that Brearley has completely lost its way. The administration and board of trustees have displayed a cowardly and appalling lack of leadership by appeasing an anti-intellectual, illiberal mob and then allowing the school to be captured by that same mob. What follows are my own personal views on Brearley anti-racism initiatives, but these are just a handful of criticisms that I know other parents have expressed. This is really well written really hard-hitting, really spot-on. I object to the view that I should be judged by the color of my skin. This is what people need to say. This is how people need to rise up. I cannot tolerate a school that not only judges my daughter by the color of her skin, but encourages an instructor to prejudge others by theirs. By viewing every element of education, every aspect of history, and every facet of society through the lens of skin color and race, we are desecrating the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King and utterly violating the movement for which such civil rights leaders believed, fought, and died. I object to the charge of systemic racism in this country and at our school. Systemic racism properly understood is segregated schools and separate lunch counters. It is the interning of Japanese and the exterminating of Jews. Systemic racism is unequivocally not a small number of isolated incidents over a period of decades. Ask any girl of any race if they have ever experienced insults from friends. Of course they have. Have ever felt slighted by teachers or have ever suffered the occasional injustice from a school at which they have spent up to 13 years of their life and you are bound to hear grievances, some petty, some not. We have not had systemic racism against blacks in this country since the civil rights reforms of the 1960s, a period of more than 50 years. To state otherwise is a flat-out misrepresentation of our country's history and adds no understanding to any of today's societal issues. If anything, long-standing and widespread policies such as affirmative action point in precisely the opposite direction. This is good stuff. I object to a definition of systemic racism, apparently supported by Brearley, that any educational, professional, or societal outcome where blacks are underrepresented is prima facie evidence of the aforementioned systemic racism of white supremacy and oppression. Good for him. Facile and unsupported beliefs such as these are the polar opposite to the intellectual and scientific truth for which Brearley claims to stand. Furthermore, I call bullshit 
on Braley's oft-stated assertion that the school welcomes and encourages the truly difficult and uncomfortable conversations regarding race and the roots of racial disparities. I object to the idea that blacks aren't able to succeed in this country without aid from government or from whites. Brearley, by adopting critical race theory, is advocating the abhorrent viewpoint that blacks should forever be regarded as helpless victims and are incapable of success regardless of their skills, talents, or hard work. What Brearley is teaching our children is precisely the true and correct definition of racism. In other words, Brearley is teaching racism. <laughs> Scott says, why isn't objectivism coming out with such strong language? What have I been doing for the last year? God. I, <laughs> I, uh, let's see. Uh, Let me just, uh, I'm just looking through the letter. I don't want to read the whole letter to you. You should, you should actually get it yourself. We have today in our country, from both political parties and all levels of government, the most unwise and unvirtuous leaders in our nation's history. Amen. Schools like Brearley are supposed to be training grounds for those leaders. Our nation will not survive a generation of leadership even more poorly educated than we have now. Nor will we survive a generation of students taught to hate its own country and despise its history. Lastly, I object with the strong. Uh, I object that the school is now fostering an environment where our daughters and our daughters' teachers are afraid to speak their mind in class for fear of quote consequences. I object that Brearley is trying to up usurp the role of parents in teaching morality and bullying parents to adopt that false morality at home. I object that Brearley is fostering a divisive community where families of different races, which until recently were part of the same community, are now segregated into two. These are the reasons why we can no longer send our daughter to Brearley. Over the past couple of months, several months, I've personally spoken to many Brearley parents, as well as parents of children at peer institutions. It is abundantly clear that the majority of parents believe that Brearley's anti-racist policies are misguided, divisive, counterproductive, and cancerous. Many believe, as I do, that these policies will ultimately destroy what was until recently a wonderful educational institution. But as I am sure will come as no surprise to you, given the insidious cancel culture that as of late permeated our society, most parents are too fearful to speak up. But speak up, you must. There is strength in numbers, and I assure you, the numbers are there. Contact the administration and board of trustees and demand an end to the destructive and anti-intellectual claptrap known as anti-racism. And if changes are not forthcoming, then demand new leadership for the sake of our community, our city, our country, and most of all, our children. Silence is no longer an option. Now, this is an amazingly well-written letter. It's written by Andrew Gutman. I recommend it. Unfortunately, he attacks and attacks and attacks. It would be nice, again, to have a positive. Something about individualism, treating people as individuals. But that, I guess, is too much to ask. But this is amazing. Uh, his name is Andrew Gutman, G-U-T-M-A-N-N. -N. Um, let me see. I'm going to post a link in the chat to the letter. I will also add it to the description uh, underneath. I generally, strongly, highly recommend that... Um, strongly, highly recommend that you subscribe to Barry Weiss's Substack, which you can Google Barry Weiss Substack. But here's the link. It's on Barry Weiss Substack. But subscribe, and then you'll get all this, all these uh, good stuff. She, she's, 
really good. You're not going to agree with a lot of what she writes, but a lot of it you will. And she's going to publish a lot of stuff on this kind of educational issues. So I think it's incredibly, incredibly valuable. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes. All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We, we've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see, I want to see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this. Uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share, and uh, you can support the show at youronbookshow.com slash support or on Patreon or Subscribestar or Locals uh, and, uh, and show your support for, all, for, for, for the work, for the value hopefully you're receiving from this. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, even if you... Even if you just come here to troll, or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe, because that way you'll know when to show up. You'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified, right? So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please. <laughs> 